Capcom's UN Squadron for the Super NES, a direct port of the original arcade coin op from 89, released two years following that, in Japan is otherwise known as Area 88, based on Kaoru Shintani's manga of the same name. MC Facepalm, Ian Bergeson, and Justin J. Bo Maloney, this is for the three of you. I know it's been over two months, but for the sake of speeding things up here, a few quick shoutouts before you kick things off. First and foremost, Somerville Media Center. Big shoutouts to these guys, McCormick, Jones, Rolk, Stone, Chandler, and the like. The Fine Brothers staff, Rafi and Benny themselves, all the producers, editors, you name it, oh, and the cast themselves, Eric, Tom, Brandon, aka Brando Commando, Morgan Tab, aka Morgie Smores, Tori Vasquez, Chelsea Cook, Geneva Piepoli, Leah L., Michaela Pascal, and others. Mike Tendo Levy and Ed Wilson from Pixel Tunes Radio, Aaron Hickman, aka Dio from San Antonio, Texas, Michael B., the Game Genie, Matt Ezra, aka Cygnus the Shirt, 20 double X, James Rolfe and Mike Matei from Cinema Massacre, Ian Bergeson from 16 Bit Heroes and The Off Season, and finally, Chris Bennett, aka the Mount Vernon Kid. With these out of our skulls, for those unaware of the game's true origin and its premise, Area 88 was the creation of Kaoru Shintani, first published back in 79 through 86 by the vastly famed Shogaku Khan, later adapted into a trilogy of anime films in 85, localized first by the ill fated US manga core Care of Central Park Media, and a recent Blu ray slash DVD release by Discotech Media, and a short lived 2000s anime show produced by Piero of Yu Yu Hakusho, Sayuki, Great Teacher Onizuka, Naruto, and Bleach fame, and Group Tack of Star Blazers, aka Space Battleship Yamato. Rest in peace to Border Ishikura. Blame, Toko, City Adventure Touch, Grappler Baki, Flint the Time Detective, aka Space Time Detective Genshi Kun, and various Street Fighter 2 anime media fame, respectively. On the latter, the premise that is, it revolved around Chin Kazama, a top of his class student at a world famous aviation school turned mercenary fighter pilot who's been romantically involved with the daughter of the Yamato Airlines owner, Ryoko Tsugumo. Despite his burning wishes to be employed there, Kazama's been unexpectedly tricked into fighting for the war-torn Middle Eastern Kingdom of Arslan's Air Force, within which the titular Area 88 is stationed, by his longtime friend since their orphanage days, Satoru Kanzaki, after getting him quote-unquote wasted as all get out, drunk that is, at a local bar and forcing him to sign up. And to top it off, he reluctantly and eventually lives up to his initially scoring destiny as part of not only facing execution after his recent abandonment from the territory, but also earning enough moolah, precisely 1.5 million bucks, to break his bullshit-ass three-year contract with the Air Force. Alongside Kazama, a US Navy ex-pilot slash Vietnam War veteran by the name of Mickey Simon, and Danish freelancer pilot slash longtime survivor Greg Gates, the latter of who serves as comic relief through the series, by the way, are hellbent on foiling the activities of a ruthless terrorist group by the name of Project 4 at any goddamn cost. Being more than just your run-of-the-mill aviation-themed shmup, you start off by picking one of the three determined pilots, all of whom have differentiating firepower advancement intervals and plane recovery duration capabilities. While Shin's more capable of the former and far less capable of the latter, Greg's the exact opposite, with Mickey being dead center regarding both factors, confirming your itinerary of operations outlined under the command of Lt. Col. Saki Vashtal and working your way forward, following which you're greeted by McCoy the Quartermaster, from whom you're free to purchase your most affordable plane in conjunction with the supporting weapons it's compatible with, either your Cluster Shot, Bombs, or Mega Crush, all of which are limited unlike your weak yet feasible Blaster, ditto for the remaining weapons depending on which attack fighter plane you've selected, namely Shin's iconic starting F-8E Crusader from the manga, unlike in the arcade version where the trio have their own respective fighters, and how much cash you started off with and or have accumulated. 
Then the action begins. You're eradicating wave after wave of Project 4 enemy assailants, be they attack choppers, turrets, fighter planes, tanks, stealth bombers, battleships, submarines, what have us. While obtaining assorted items, running the gamut from orange and blue power boosters that increase your plane's weapon attack level by 1 and 3 points respectively, but take note some of them can even decrease your weapon level. Weapon racks that refill your current special weapon supplies, depending on which ones in use, stars that add an extra 5,000 bucks to your pilot's overall balance, mechanical devices, or what Bergeson likes to call them, Chun Li's, that serve as instant screen nukes, whose design is reused in Street Fighter 2 and its later editions, cause what the hell, Capcom, Yashichi fans for refilling your plane's fuel tank, and even unicorns for a temporary shield, the latter two of which are the absolute rarest, and accumulating more moolah to purchase better aircrafts and more special weapons. Speaking of which, control-wise, in conjunction with the D-pad for the customary free-range movement of your plane, cause what the hell is just shmup, Y, B, and X are used, by default, to deploy your fighter plane's Vulcan cannon, great for 10 shots while holding the former down, in which case you'd have to press it again, and its special weapons, as well as swap around any one of said special weapons at will, individually. Your vitality meter at the bottom right represents that of your plane. Thus, should your plane collide into any opposing weapons, projectiles, and or environmental hazards once, it'll ring up danger while its klaxon blares, in which case, avoid any further damage until said klaxon stifles itself. However, your plane will crash and burn like a motherfucker if you endure way too many fatal collisions, thereby resulting in, oh what a shock, an instant goddamn life loss. While, of course, this system rarely occurs in the beginning, it'll get extremely fucking aggravating whenever each attacker strives to make you their bitch, even if you happen to reach the halfway point of the game. Therefore, I offer a nickel's worth of free advice. Get used to it or else. Upon reaching the ass end of each crucial mission, except for the bonus rounds, which of course, I'll discuss in Two Shakes of a Lamb's Tale, or in this case, 24 swipes of the hair strands of Morgie S'mores, Chelsea, Geneva, Tori, and Olivia from React. The customary pulse-pounding boss altercations come into play, involving the following, an oversized missile-launching megatank, stealth bombers armed with Vulcan bombs, machine gun cannons, and lethal-as-fuck missiles, both appearing in a large dark gray model and three miniaturized purple decoys, hence the latter's codename, the Wolfpack, and no, this has nothing to do with the hangover, period! an underwater submarine codenamed Seavet, armed to the gills with nuclear bombs deployed either underwater or above the surface, most of which split into smaller bombs when damaged, a ginormous-ass ground carrier with missiles deployed from four hatches per section, though it sometimes deploys three, as well as from its bottom hangar, an attack plane summoned from either side of said carrier, an incomparably lengthy battleship by the name of Minx, armed with five laser cannons, two missile batteries, and four massive cannons that deploy randomly guided gunfire, the latter of which are the high-priority weak points upon optionally dispatching the former two types, the almost impenetrable as fuck Forest Fortress, with turrets on every tower and enemy plane and tank flanks surrounding it, the high-powered high-octane jumbo jet, complete with mines that explode into eight homing missiles upon discharging, missiles ten times the width of even a freaking streetlight that drop from the bottom, and is beyond liable to zip ahead if you're away from its range, there by emitting a colossal and hazardous exhaust flame from its rear, and last but definitely not least, the quote-unquote Project 4 Trifecta, made up of a mechanical ceiling-rigged superweapon that emits flames on either side, with a blue orb in the center serving as its control unit, hence, of course, its weak point, while being heavily guarded by two types of assault trailers, missile launchers and flamethrowers, the silver-clad spy plane armed with eight missile turrets at the top, a Vulcan cannon at the bottom left, and pods that release a single missile when discharged, and your planes within their range, and finally, the burgundy and magenta-clad P4 megaship, armed with six turrets with two on the side, of course amongst various other offenses we've seen every other boss exhibit up until this point, making even the Hunter Killers from the Terminator franchise look like fucking broken down dune buggies. Depending on which plane you reserved, as well as the necessary weapons you've stocked yourself and it, the plane that is, with, you'll either have a promising, victory-worthy advantage over them, or a living, nightmarish hell of the upside-down sinners on your hands. In other words, expect more of the latter if you're not well-equipped. Your next mission awaits you, however, if you flawlessly triumph over every aerial altercation, thus awarding you extra cash for those aforementioned advanced attack planes and weaponry. Regarding the optional bonus rounds, you're given precisely 43 seconds to obliterate the enemy Quartermaster Corps' heavy artillery and supply trucks, for which you're awarded even more cash, depending on how much you farmed your ass off. And believe me, you'll need as much as possible if you're to stand any chance whatsoever against those dick-brained Project 4 sons of bitches. Before I forget, never let any of them get near the starting base, cause they'll eventually invade the piss out of it, thereby egregiously fucking yourself over in the long run.
Apart from everything else, the controls are nothing short of intuitive and favorable to accustom oneself to, in spite of the tendency to unwittingly collide into hazardous shit, which I highly advise taking into fucking consideration, by the way. And the gameplay procedure is standard, albeit a tad jarring, not to mention far from an instantaneous bore fest. And let me tell you, I'm flat out low key not lying here. Challenge wise, must I mindlessly repeat myself any further regarding the hardships and strife through which you'll ride out, or in this case, fly out, within each operation, let alone the differentiating capabilities between each of the three pilots? While it's neither impossible nor relentless in comparison to every other shmup out there, Greatest 3, Earth Defense Force, D Force, and Darius Twin, I'm looking at the four of you. You and Squadron will do way more than curse the day you've ever engaged yourself into one of the most extremely aggravating games ever conceived. It'll dramatically derail your expectations, worse than every real life train accident in history, and especially WSD Time himself. I shit you not! First off, the use of your lightning fast reflexes is absolute key here, especially when it comes to evading all gunfire and sudden collisions. Also, there's other aircraft types that you're better off experimenting with down the road, cause their capabilities far outweigh the shit out of the F-8E Crusader, considering they cost much more. Case in point, the golden-clad A-10A Thunderbolt and silver-clad YF-23 Stealth Ray can attack both downward and upward respectively, in conjunction with the standard straight-on offenses. The F-14B Tomcat travels much faster in tandem with exhibiting more dynamic attack range and power. The F-20 Tiger Shark attacks both downward and upward simultaneously in addition to forward, and the ultimate as fuck F-200 Afrit shits dramatically on all the other aircraft in terms of every basic attack and mobility function, despite the former traveling the fastest in comparison to the others. While you're better off with the F-8E Crusader during the first two or three areas, and especially the bonus dogfights against the enemy's Quartermaster Corps, at some point, you'll have to experiment with the other five fighter planes and their participating weapons, depending on how much of a staggering balance you've made thus far. Mostly due to the obvious multi-directional attack and high mobility capabilities I've been shooting my cake hole off about, not to mention the post-damage recovery duration and firepower level augmentation habits dependent on the pilot you've picked beforehand. Regarding the latter two factors, they'll more than determine your ultimate skill against each and every devious adversary out there. Oh, and unless you started off as Mickey, be sure not to overpurchase or overuse any special weapons, even during the heat of any intense as hell dogfight, cause the chances of being obliterated to dick all before having an opportunity to deploy them are higher than even the summit of Mount fucking Everest! Constructive hints set in stone for the masses to take into steadfast account, and starting off with three continues, regardless of or depending on which difficulty mode you've set beforehand. Don't get too discouraged if you happen to be suffering over any overwhelming as fuck altercation, cause at least your senses of self awareness and mental stability will dramatically improve in between each long hungered attempt. Thus, quoting one of my all time favorite anime shows, Trigun, every journey begins with a single step, we just have to have patience. Graphically, taking this game's age into consideration, in other words, it's an early SNES title, released the same year as Final Fight and Super Ghouls and Ghosts, two other Capcom Tour de Forces, its presentation is more than serviceable, exhibiting not only all the six available planes and or the three main pilots that helmed them or their supporting Arslan base personnel, namely the earlier recounted Saki and McCoy, no damn it, not that McCoy, rest in peace to Forrest Kelly, but all the accompanying stage backgrounds, on land, over sea, and in the air alike, and the endless opposing platoons of the Project 4 squads. Granted, while the presentation is toned down from its original arcade counterpart, it's at least compensated for by the well enriched 5 layer parallax scrolling effects and the post stage dialogue provided by the three pilots. The overall character designs don't disappoint in the least either, considering the liberties Capcom took with the source material, as they did with various Disney licenses, not to mention Willow, both the arcade platformer and the NES RPG, Sweet Home on Famicom, and even Hiroshimoto Miya's Tenchi Wo Kurao, aka Destiny of an Emperor on NES, and even Dynasty Warriors and Warriors of Fate on Arcade, but I digress. And let's not get ourselves started with the convincing, if eventually redundant, victory quotes of the three main pilots, let alone the tolerable yet searing challenge that every end stage interaction applies throughout your high flying crusade. As far as music and sound, arranged masterfully by Mari Yamaguchi of Mega Man 5 fame, alongside Toshio Kajino, alias Bull, and Yasushi Ikeda, alias Ike Bomb, the latter of Final Fight and Super Ghouls and Ghosts fame, based somehow loosely on Manami Matsumai's original arcade soundtrack. Yep, it's the same lady who composed the first Mega Man. As dull and uninviting many find the songs to be, and clear as their reality, they kick far too much ass and are far too remarkable and noteworthy to be considered as such, hence my high priority emphasis on the latter two adjectives. In other words, each and every theme throughout screams Top Gun all over the motherfucking place, thanks entirely to the synth-infused, melodic, and protracted upbeat compositions provided for each in-game incident. And who the hell could possibly forget that sweeping overture of an intro anthem, right? Anyways, tune over whoring aside, the participating sound effects have its shares of pluses and minuses, and that the latter involves them being a hair redundant after a given period of time, even considering it's not that much of a gripe. Then again, why jump the gun by shoehorning in any possible negatives? 
but on the former, they flat out piss uncontrollably on those of its original arcade counterpart in as many ways as humanly fucking possible. And as always, take note of my top 10 songs shown here. Replayability wise, I in full honesty cannot stress enough how much I recommend this often proclaimed title considering I'm a massive shmup addict like many others. I'm looking at you again, Bergerson. Due entirely to not only the three main pilots and their distinctive strengths and weaknesses, the six planes they're able to experiment with in whichever order of missions you're bound to follow, during which those lightning fast reflexes and other key strategies about which I've discussed earlier are a must. As long as you're capable enough of taking these into account, in conjunction with applying a substantial deal of attrition throughout each operation, it's no small wonder or deep dark secret that you'll be soaring 90,000 feet high into UN Squadron. Therefore, you'd be high off your ass to even bother turning it the fuck down and thereby doing yourself a dickish disservice in the process. Henceforth, what's my final verdict? It's easy to see why this Capcom spectacle of a shmup has been vastly cited and acclaimed throughout the decades as one of the era's and the console's most prominent titles. Apart from a setback or two I might have addressed, which won't be echoed at this juncture, and especially one which I remorsefully overlooked, particularly the traditional slowdown that most Nintendo games are known for, including some of the other titles I've babbled about, and especially Konami's Axelay, it's still an all-around convival, blood-boiling, hangs-up hell of a thrill ride for which seatbelts aren't needed, with the exception of three necessary elements. Business sense, nerves of steel, and rapid-fast speed. So what the Christ are you waiting for, Chinese New Year? Sniff this title out already, and indulge yourself in what it offers, and then some, and be sure to watch the anime OAVs from 85, available both on DVD and Blu-ray from Discotech Media, and or VHS, considering some of them might be out of print depending on where you look, from the ill-fated US manga core Care of Central Park Media, and of course the anime show for Back in L4, also on DVD from the also ill-fated ADV. Until then, considering how awesome it is to be back after a 3 to 4 month long hiatus, this is the Hardcore Retro God proudly and triumphantly signing off.